Welcome to PyMCCon. I'm Ravine, and I'm the chair of this conference. This is our first event where Dante Gates is going to talk about data generating processes. However, we forgot to hit record on the Zoom call, which is why you're seeing me first. But this gives me an opportunity to introduce PyMCCon. PyMCCon is a rolling series of events, and you can find them all at pymccon.com. If you'd like to submit a talk, our call for proposals is always open. So go to the same website, pymccon.com, and go to the CFP page, and you'll see instructions on how to submit your own talk. And if you'd like to help put on this conference, which is a community-run conference, you can join the volunteers. Instructions are on the website as well. With that, let's jump to the recording of Dante's talk on data generating processes. Cool. So. As you now see, the webinar is being recorded. The people on YouTube uh, missed uh, Dante's introduction, but we will post it on the description of the uh, YouTube video. So Dante, with that, feel free to start whenever you want. Great. Sounds good. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, let's see. I will uh, share my screen here. Oh, you know what? I have the option to share screen, but it's saying that it's disabled for participants. Oh, really? Um, you should, I will make you co-host. Okay. You should be a panelist, but I will make you a co-host just in case. Uh -huh. I think that did it. Yeah. Great. And here we are. Um, is everyone able to see that? Yes, I can see it. Okay, great. So thanks again for the introduction. Also, just want to um, uh, give uh, Fernando and Robin both uh, just a thank you for uh, the experience so far with being a part of this conference. It's been really cool getting feedback from uh, the team as we've been working through this. Um, I'm not sure who's listening that saw the Google Code Lab notebook that we put out ahead of this, but that was actually Fernando's suggestion to me. So I think it was a great add to this event. I'll have a link to that later on, uh, just provide some more detail to some of the uh, topics that we're getting into here. So anyway, I'll jump into it now. So uh, my talk here is entitled The Power of Bayesian Industry, and the emphasis is really going to be um, a, a little bit on theory, but not too much, mainly on how do we take this idea that's sort of fundamental to, to Bayes, the data generating process, and apply that within an industry context. So I already got an introduction. I will skip the about me slide. I uh, will give this little quick outline just to give everyone an idea of where we're going. So we're going to start off with a little bit of background, just explaining what a data generating process is, providing a motivating example for some of the really interesting things that you can do once you understand um, how to incorporate that idea into your models. And then I'm going to spend a lot of time focusing on how we can uh, generalize the ideas from the background to different kinds of problems. And I'm going to give some specific, I'm going to give some specific context um, related to uh, models that would be relevant to the kinds of things that we do at PerPay. So I'm going to spend the bulk of my time there trying to just provide um, just an even uh, bigger concrete example of how we can do this. And uh, then lastly, we'll just kind of conclude with a discussion uh, to wrap up. So without further ado, getting started. First of all, what is a data generating process? And it's actually pretty simple. Um, there are a couple of ways that I see this term get used. So I'll put both of them here because I think they're both relevant to the purposes of our discussion. On the one hand, we have what is called the true data generating process. And I guess that's really like the proper definition of a data generating process. And that's whatever the real world phenomenon is that's creating the data that you see. So um, for example, maybe it's just something as simple as rolling a die and the data that you have is basically the outcomes that you observe on each roll of the die. Another idea that's related but distinct is the true data generating process as modeled. And that's something that we're going to focus on a lot here. Um, our goal is basically going to be to align those. I'm going to call this a first principles approach. And the example that we'll walk through will really make that clear why. Uh, but our goal is basically to try and think about modeling from a perspective that places an emphasis on allowing our models 
to not just implicitly model outputs of the data generating process, but to explicitly model the process itself. So the best example that I can think of uh, to illustrate this idea is the stand case study on predicting the success of a golf putt. And I'm gonna go fairly quickly through this section because the CoLab notebook that I mentioned at the beginning goes into a lot of the details of how we get from one step to another within here. There's also a lot of other good resources, uh, both from Stan, uh, the PyMC example gallery also has a walkthrough of this. So there's a lot of other places that you can find more in-depth information about this, but I do wanna walk through it just to kind of give everybody a baseline of where we're starting at. So the data set that we're working with in this example here is pretty simple. You essentially have one feature, X. It's the distance of the putt to the hole. Then we have a couple of features that describe the outcomes, the total number of shots taken from that distance, and then the total number of putts that were successful from that distance. And if we were to graph the data, we would see that the probability of success goes down the further you, you move away from the hole. So it's pretty straightforward. Uh, in the data set, like I said, it's fairly small. There's only one feature essentially, and there's also only 19 rows of data. And I think it goes up to putts of maybe 20 feet or something like that. So what's really interesting about the stand case study is uh, instead of just trying to predict putt success or not, they take a step back and they consider the true data generating process, which is there's a physical phenomenon going on. There's a golfer with a club trying his best to hit the ball into the hole. And so they basically start from that perspective and then consider how can we model that process? And um, the introduction to how they start thinking about modeling the process is this sketch. And this is what I think is really interesting. It's how we get from this sketch to a model. So on the left, we have the ball. On the right, we have the hole. And basically what we're showing here is that there's some threshold of tolerance or error in the angle that you hit a ball such that the ball is either going to travel into the hole or not. In other words, if you hit it too wide, you're going to miss. If you hit it perfectly zero degree error, you're going to make it. And then given the distance, there's some threshold of degrees of error in that angle of the shot where you can still have a successful putt. So they take that sketch, they layer some assumptions on top of it, they fit a model, the model looks really good. This is from their case study, just showing the comparison of the geometry-based model or what we could call the first principles model against something like logistic regression. And it's a pretty good fit. This is really interesting. There's a lot of things to think about here. In summary, they began with some very basic assumptions. So the data set consists of putts from professional golfers. So they assume that everyone in the data set is trying their best to hit the ball perfectly straight to the hole. There's some degree of error that uh, we that is common among all of the golfers that are in the data set. So they add that as a parameter to the model. They sketch the mental model. They let the math play out, and then they fit the model. <laughs> and one thing that I think is really interesting to emphasize here is the outcome they're modeling is not necessarily just you know is y zero or one was the putt a success or not as we're accustomed to with a lot of traditional machine learning methods that just treat classification tasks as zeros and ones, but they're asking a more interesting question that's actually more related to the fundamental data generating process. They're asking through the model, will the ball go in the hole? In a sense, it's the same thing. Uh, you know, the difference is, is subtle, but it's actually very important. Um, and you can see even just how that plays out in the graph on the left, you get a much tighter fit just by embedding some of this domain knowledge uh, or assumptions of the data generating process into the model. Another interesting comment here is um, that when we think about a black box model, we often think about, we don't know what's happening inside the model. But I think another way that I often find myself thinking about black, spot, black, black box models these days is that, uh, the black box models are the ones where they have no context of the data generating process. So the logistic regression just sees an X and it sees a zero and a one. The geometry based model is seeing a little bit of the context of the model. It's seeing a little bit of the first principles of the data generating process. 
So my transition here is, is this just like, you know, a cute little party trick or is this something that's actually useful, something that's actually interesting? And the answer is it's something that's actually interesting. I'll talk a little bit about Perpay now. This is my transition into uh, introducing you to what we do at Perpay and how we can take this concept and apply it to some concrete examples that you may not have seen before. So one of the key things that we do here at Perpay is we're trying to offer both credit access and credit building to consumers that are often um, uh, not, uh, that are often overlooked by uh, traditional credit products. And one of the ways we do that is through this e-commerce marketplace. So this is a little screenshot of the marketplace. You know, it's very similar to an Amazon or something like that. But the key is that when you check out, that checkout is essentially creating an application. So it, this is a lending process, which is how we're giving people credit access and it's also how we're giving people credit building opportunities through the lending. So I wanna follow the same procedure that we examined in the stand case study, which is basically, let's start with a couple sketches. Let's layer a little bit of math on top of that. And then let's just see where that goes and see if we can build a model. So what I'm gonna show here, I'm gonna try and keep it pretty high level. I think the concept should be fairly intuitive for most people, um, but I'll, I'll try not to, uh, you know, I'll try to explain what's necessary as we go and I'll keep it at a fairly high level, not too specific to per pay. What we talk about here would pretty much be true of any lending product in general. So um, assume you're not even per pay, you're just any, you know, generic lending company, you're the, the Acme lending company or whatever, one of the first things that you might be interested in uh, as a lending company or as a data scientist at this company is your default rates. So this x-axis x axis here, time, this is basically time that goes on since uh, uh, t equals zero here would basically be when you take out the loan and then uh, we'll watch what happens throughout the life of the loan. So as I said, one of the first things we may be interested in is modeling our default rates. So I'm gonna put a little placeholder here to mark out the default rates. And the reason why I'm using a dashed line is because depending on where you're at on this x-axis in real time, you may or may not actually observe the default rates. It takes people time to stop making their payments and then it, you know, it takes time for that loan to actually default. So these things are kind of gonna trickle in over time cumulatively, maybe something like this. Another thing that you would be interested in modeling is basically the opposite of default. And uh, this we'll call liquidation. These are people who pay off their loan balances in full. This can happen at the beginning of a loan, but it's not that often uh, that you'll see people complete loans immediately. Usually you'll see them, you know, same sort of thing, trickle in as the duration of the loan progresses, maybe something like this. So this office liquidation will also use the dashed line again, just to indicate that there are these mature liquidation and default rates, which we might not observe given how far into the uh, lifetime of the loan that we are. One last thing that I want to note here is that um, when we say default, we don't just mean a missed payment. So a user can miss a payment and they basically are late on their account, but an industry standard is not to mark that loan as default right away. Basically, you allow some period of time to pass. Let's just call that capital T. And after a loan has been in a past due state for that amount of time, then it will be considered uh, late. So that could be, say, 100 days. After 100 days in the late status, that account is now defaulted and it's no longer considered an asset. And just from this, there's a lot of really interesting things that we can start building on. So let's notice a couple of things. One is that um, your mature default and liquidation rates sum to one. So in other words, what we're saying is that at the end of the day, you can either uh, loan will liquidate or a loan will, will default, uh, but it can't be in both. It's a mutually exclusive event. So as everything matures, your long-term rates are either going to, uh, are gonna sum to one. Uh, another interesting relationship that we can pull out of this is an important concept, which are the, uh, we'll call these in-flight loans. So these are loans that have not yet either liquidated or defaulted. They're still in progress. And this is basically one minus whatever our default rate at that given point in time is, one minus our liquidation rate. 
this isn't necessarily, you know, uh, this is, it, it's kind of obvious um, to, if you're in the lending business, that this is the way that it works. Um, but I think that's one of the things that's really interesting is that we're starting very simple principles and we're going to start building things on top of it. A couple other things to note from this. So we have some constraints. For example, the probability that a loan liquidates on day zero is zero. Probability a loan defaults on day zero is zero. Probability that loan is in flight on day zero is one. Basically, everybody starts off that way. Yeah. Probability that a loan is in flight as t goes to infinity is zero because eventually you're either going to have to liquidate or you're going to have to default um you can't be in an intermediate state forever and then the last thing that we'll note from this plot is that these two curves are always increasing so again once you hit one of these states you're stuck there uh that loan it basically terminates at that state and it's not going to jump back and forth so one way to express that is basically the probability that uh loan has defaulted at time t is less than or equal to, I guess, strictly less than uh, t plus one. Just to summarize, we've got a couple sketches here. We pulled out some basic mathematical relationships out of this. And this actually right now is enough to start building uh, a model that's fairly interesting on top of. So here we'll start walking, here we'll start walking through some of the PyMC code and take a look at what this actually looks like. Uh, this is sort of pseudo YMC, but this code essentially would run. Um, so we do need to start off somewhere. And we have different choices that we could make in this scenario. But we're going to start off, let's say, by modeling our default rates. I'm putting these dots on you know, the right-hand side of the equation just to indicate that there's a number of ways that you could estimate what that long-term chore default rate is. Uh, but you know, it could be as simple as just assigning it uh, to like the beta distribution, or there's a number of ways that you can get there. But let's just assume that we have a method that we feel pretty good about in terms of learning what the long-term default rate is. So one of the interesting things now about that approach is if we have the long-term default rate, we get the long-term liquidation rate for free. Again, this is just um, a feature of math uh, because those two things sum to one as you know time goes to infinity. So if you have one, you get the other for free, which is very interesting. Another thing is that uh, it's not that difficult to take these two terms that we got above and infer what the in-flight rates are. And a nice little trick for doing this is basically taking the long-term rates and multiplying them by a CDN. If you haven't seen this trick before, um, this is a convenient way. A CDF is basically monotonic increasing. So that's one of our constraints that we have on these curves. And it goes from zero to one. So if you multiply that by a probability, you'll get that curve to now go between zero and whatever that probability is. So this is a nice way to model those inflate rates. Similar as above with liquidation, once we have those, we get the inflate rate for free uh, with no additional effort, just by subtracting those two features from one. And then you can throw them all together in a likelihood. Um, where basically we treat this as a multinomial at any given point in time, you've either defaulted, you've liquidated, or you're still in flight. The probabilities are as described above. And at this point, uh, with honestly not a ton of code, um, I mean, I did skip some details, but with not a ton of effort, uh, just building on top of the principles from the sketch that we looked at, we basically get every feature on that checklist that we had there's a lot of interesting things that happen in this process. We got a lot of advantages over, say, just like a traditional vanilla machine learning method. One thing that I think is really interesting about this is this sort of model is really robust to overfitting. And here's one way you can see that that's the case. Um, it would be really hard to overfit. It would be really hard to overfit your default rates because this multinomial likelihood uh, if you're overestimating or overfitting your default rates, you're going to do it at the expense of liquidation and in flight. So this is kind of saying, supposing that our data generating process is a solid conceptual model for the data that we actually observe, and we built that into the model that I just described, um, you might underfit, but it's going to be very difficult to overfit. Uh, also, the model maps really cleanly 
to the business model, not just the business outcomes, but you get the business outcomes too. In fact, you get five of them. So we started thinking about default. We ended up getting five items of interest, long-term default, long-term liquidation, and then all of our inflate rates. And they're self-consistent with one another. In other words, if you were to sample from this posterior and uh, add up all your inflate rates, you'll always get something that equals total number of loans that's in the data that you're sampling from. So you get consistent estimates, which is also a really nice feature that is difficult to get from a traditional, just sort of out of the box machine learning method. It's easy to explain. It's easy to troubleshoot. A lot of great features about this sort of thing. We can critique it though. Um, so one thing about this model is that it's just kind of modeling the loan state. So it's modeling the percentage of loans in a given state. And in a lending business, it's not actually the most important thing to you. You really care about the number of dollars that have gone to LinkedIn. This model doesn't take that into account at all. Uh, but it's still a good starting point. And it also makes some assumptions that are maybe dubious. We assume that, uh, you know, the uh, probability of default for two loans are independent, which isn't necessarily the case because accounts could take out more than one loan. Again, there's lots of things to critique here. One thing that I will say that is interesting about this is there's a lot of things to critique here, not just from being a data scientist, but just anyone that has understanding or knowledge of how the business works can contribute to the assumptions that are baked into this model. One critique that I do want to that I do want to focus on is the fact that this model has no features. So if we kind of come back, I mean, we started with the default rate, which we learned, but I, there's no inputs flowing into this model. We're just learning a default rate. Everything else is falling out of the math and we're just fitting that default rate such that we hit our observed values, but there's no features. So let's take a look at how we could iterate on what we have here uh, in a fairly simple way and add some features. And to do that, um, let's just consider what it means uh, for a loan to be defaulted uh, at time t. So for a loan to have defaulted at time t, I'm going to go fairly quickly here, but um, hopefully this is this is hopefully I'm not going too fast. Uh, but I will go a little quickly here. But for a loan to default at time t, there's basically two ways that that could happen. One is that that loan had defaulted capital T days earlier, right? So that's that sort of business logic rule that we have where uh, you don't mark a late account as delinquent until T days, capital T days have passed. So one way, that, and once you hit that state, you're stuck there. So one way that you could be uh, in this in-flight observe default bucket is if you were in that bucket capital T days ago. The other way that you can get there is if you were past due T minus T days ago, and you never recovered. In other words, you never got out of that past due state. So this is another assumption that the previous version of the model sort of overlooked. Uh, we didn't necessarily explicitly account for the fact that you could be past due and uh, continue making payments and eventually liquidate. So with this understanding, DT minus capital T, that is, um, that's a known quantity as is this past due feature here, that's a known quantity. And basically we can add a parameter to the model, which is this recovery rate. Now, in order to actually get something that we can fit, let's call this DT star. And then let's just remember uh, how we were modeling the in-flight rate previously. Previously, we were saying the in-flight rate was your long-term mature delinquency times some CDF of T, right? And what we can do is basically combine these two things to say that the long-term mature default rate is basically D T star over the CDM. And uh, by the way, I'm going to make all these slides available and whatnot after the talk. So if I went fast, you can always come back and review this stuff and convince yourself that this is true. Um, and the code kind of looks like this. Uh, we basically, instead of having a D here, we have an R and we plug in our inputs, the DT and the PDT. And uh, we add the one minus recovery rate here, divide by total number of loans to get this inflate rate and then divide out by the CDF. Uh, you're gonna have to be careful when you 
actually define this and make sure that you're getting something that's actually a valid value so that the sampler doesn't explode. For example, if this is greater than DT, you get a probability that's greater than one, but details, details. Other than that, everything else is the same as before. So uh, we just kind of swapped out a component, added a new parameter, and we're getting something now that has inputs and uh, incorporates even more of the business context. So results. When I first wrote this abstract, uh, I thought I would show some results of what this model looks like on per page data. And I thought that I would just obscure the axes so that, uh, you know, not to give away anything that's proprietary. Well, here's an interesting thing about this model. Because we're modeling everything all at once, there's literally no way to just obscure the axes and not give away what we have uh, because everything's there. So if you have, you know, the liquidation and default rates, you can look at the proportion between those and you know that they add to one and you could kind of infer what things are. So no results. I thought about just including results on maybe just one of the parameters, but then that amounts to you basically taking my word for it that it works on the rest. And so I figured I would just say, take my word for it. This does work. I mean, again, I, I made a lot of simplifications here, um, but this approach actually does work on live data. So again, I hope I didn't go too fast here. Um, I'm happy to field any questions on this at the end of the talk. And as I said, I'll make the slides available, but more than getting into all of the details of exactly how to make something like this work, I really just wanted to sort of expand the putting example to something a little bit bigger and a little bit more business oriented to give you guys just another concrete model of, or concrete, uh, you know, uh, idea or motivation of how you might be able to apply these things uh, in your own projects. And with this, I'll get to our discussion and uh, then we'll go to a QA. and a Little disclaimer at the discussion, this is gonna get fairly hand wavy. So, uh, you know, take all this with a grain of salt, but first of all, I wanna answer why industry, um, you know, that's in the title of my talk. So I took this little snippet from Wikipedia that says usually did or usually scholars don't know the real data generating model, which I suppose is true if you're a scholar, but in industry, a lot of times you know what's going on. I mean, in the example I just showed you, that's basically the subtitle of my talk, right? Your business model is your data generating function. You know exactly how the inputs are flowing through into the outputs that you observe because you've defined all the machinery more or less. Um, and why Bayesian? I mean, an obvious thing is priors. I mean, this is all about priors. They're huge here, right? Um, uh, not just the range of values that we assign to the parameters in our models, but also the decisions we make as to um, how we're gonna model that data generating process. And another note is that all Bayesian models are data generating processes. So here's the famous Bayes theorem on the neon sign. Suppose we were going to inspect this, but just as we were two people got in front of us, take snapshots of it. Um, that's okay, because all we wanna look at here is the left side. I think this is actually the most, or I think this is actually the most interesting aspect of, uh, of Bayes' theorem, the left-hand side. Uh, Cause what we're saying here, this is kind of telling you everything you need to know about Bayes, which is that your data is what you assume is given and your model parameters is what you assume that vary. And because we assume model parameters to vary in the Bayesian context, it means we can sample from them, which means we can hold our data fixed and we have a data generating process. And then lastly, why PyMCCon? Why did I submit this as a proposal to this conference? Why did I think it was appropriate here? In theory, these concepts would apply to any probabilistic programming language. Um, but uh, as was mentioned in the Intro, I'm a huge fan of PyMC. I've been using it for quite some time now, and I've never really come across something where it couldn't satisfy my needs. Um, a couple of things that I'd like to point out here, though, is this is the putting model here. This is, this is basically the code for the putting example. And uh, PyMC is super hackable. That's one of the things I like about it. So in order to fit that putting model, you basically need the normal cumulative distribution function. It may be included somewhere in PyMC. I'm not sure that it is though. I couldn't find it, but that's okay. It's easy enough to just define it yourself. 
um, very hackable. And the syntax is very much like NumPy and all the other tools that you're probably familiar with. In addition, we're fitting this model in just four lines of code. I mean, just four lines of code. All the sampling and everything else just kind of happened magically under the hood, which is really interesting. And then the last bit that I'll note is bringing this back to the idea of the data generating process. Something that struck me as I was um, working on this talk is that the way that you think about the data generating process, sort of from the bottom up or from your assumptions to your observed data, it's actually very natural fit with the way that we think about programming in terms of, especially in an environment like Python, where everything's sort of eagerly evaluated one line at a time. If you look at these four lines, they flow in the exact way that you would think about the uh, data generating process, just going from the assumptions of that putting sketch to the likelihood. You have your threshold for success. You have some measure of the error of putting. You have your probability of making a successful shot, and then you have your likelihood. So I think this is, you know, if you're a programmer or you, or you write a lot of code, I think this just kind of fits really nicely into the into the workflows that we're used to. Uh, and it's not necessarily that that's like an axiom of truth or anything, but it's sort of an artifact of the tools that we have at our disposal. But it's still very interesting. And then lastly. I'll try and answer the question, why should I care? I mean, I think I mentioned probably a fair number of those points um, in terms of like technical modeling advantages. Um, but uh, I also addressed some of them in the Google Colab thing, so I won't belabor this point. There is one point that I'd like to focus on, and I call this humans one, robots zero. And what I mean by that is uh, this is the sort of thing where I think as an experienced practitioner, you can really bring a lot of value over some of the more, uh, let's just say automated methods. This is kind of tongue in cheek here. Again, I said, this is very hand wavy, this discussion section. Um, but if you think about something like Google ML trying to fit, or Google Auto ML, not taking shots at Google, but if you think about something like Google Auto ML trying to fit to the 19 rows of data in the putting example, I don't know what it would do, but it wouldn't give you something that gives you more insight into the problem, like the first principle models does. And also the first principles model helps you compensate for the lack of data. It gives you something that uh, even if you wish you had more data or more features, you still feel pretty comfortable with it because uh, you know you have these constraints of the business domain that are built on top of it. And uh, you know maybe like a less tumble cheap way to say this is. You know, maybe this isn't just a, this isn't just necessarily the advantage we bring over the robots, but even personally, this is the uh, value that I bring. Uh, you know, as a data scientist today, that I didn't have five years ago. Uh, you know, five, six, seven years ago, um, there was a whole variety of problems that I would not be able to tackle without kind of understanding these principles. So it really helps you. I think focusing on these methods uh, really gives you a lot of room to grow in your career as a data scientist. And my watch just hit 30 minutes exactly, which is pretty pretty amazing, because uh, that's the end of it. Prepay is hiring, as we mentioned, and uh, I will figure out how to stop sharing and turn this over to Fernando. To me. Yeah, so thank you, Dan. That was amazing. Uh, I think my very my first question is which system did you use for in the slides? I love that you were, you were able to do the whiteboarding <laughs> in real <laughs> in real uh, time. Yeah, I used something called Quarto. Uh, there were a lot of people talking about it at Pi Data in New York a few months ago, so I figured I'd give it a try for this. And it does all the cool animations with the code and everything, and uh, generates the HTML really clean way. So it was super easy for me to take these slides and put it on the blog. So shout out to Corto. Cool. That's amazing. So yeah, yeah, it really related with a lot of the concept that you said. And we have a few questions from the audience. And um, so I will read the one of them. Uh, Giresh, sorry if I put your, your name. Um, he says, or she says, also very curious about what kind of infrastructure automation you utilize in the context of using this model in a repeatable manner. I will post it in the chat, just in case. That is a really good question. And I will be honest and say that um, for this methodology, 
uh, I often go to this more in the context of data analysis. So if I'm trying to understand a new problem and if my assumptions uh, or like sort of the domain expertise that I've been getting actually matches the data that we get, um, this is sort of like a really nice way that I'd like to kind of dig into those things. If your assumptions around the data generating process aren't really valid, uh, usually the model will fail pretty spectacularly. Either the sampler will blow up or when you look at the trace plots or prior predictives or posterior predictive checks, you'll see things that just don't make sense. So I use this a lot more for analysis than I do for necessarily deploying predictive models to production environments, although you could do that as well. Um, if you were interested in that, I did see a talk uh, that is on YouTube from PyData a while back about uh, wrapping PyMC in, an S in a scikit-learn API, which may be a little bit closer to what you're asking. Cool. Yeah, also as part of the PyMC column web series, I think the 15th of March will have one about scalable Bayesian modeling. Uh, so that also might be interesting for people interested in that. And um, there is another question about uh, if there is a way from RGM in this course, I, I don't know the real name, uh, is there a way to quantify whether a model that we design is correctly specified, i.e. it represents the true data generating process? I don't know if I have um, an answer to that question. I mean, I think my previous answer may get to that a little bit in the sense that um, if your assumptions don't actually match what you're seeing going on, you might start to notice funny things. I'll give you an example. Um, we had done something where uh, we kind of tried to build a like um, a Markov transition model, right? So like a state space model. So you're state one to state two to state three, et cetera. Uh, based off of, and we tried to build that model to track how people progress throughout our platform. And uh, we started to notice that at the end of the day, uh, if you fit that model and you run it out, everybody defaults. And we're thinking, hmm, man, that's a really terrible business model then, right? Everybody's going to default. Well, we weren't accounting for quite a few things. Uh, one thing is not accounting for people churning and naturally leaving the platform. Also not accounting for the people who um, or just stellar and been on the platform for five years with no, uh, you know, with, with just great behavior and no delinquency. So, um, that was a case where our idea of the data generating process was close, uh, but where it started to fall apart actually gave us quite a few new insights into actually, uh, finding a, a model, the data generating process that was a little more realistic. Cool. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, the, there is another question. Uh, there's two other questions from Giresh in the discourse. I'm not going to say those out loud because they're more finance technical. So I think maybe later you can go back and answer in writing there. There is another one more related to Bayesian statistics that I think that's the reason most of us are here. Um, basically, it's asking about how you navigated divergences when building PyMC models. Uh, this person says that they have regularly run into divergences. And they have found method, Bayesian method very useful in situations small data, but they have struggled to get full convergence with no divergences. How, what has been your experience with that? I guess I would have two, I guess three things I would say about that. One is uh, always start simple. Um, so for example, on the example I just went through, First iteration, just see if you can fit the long-term delinquency rate and then just do a long-term uh, or then just do the in-flight delinquency rate and add things incrementally. One trap that I often find myself getting into is adding things too quickly and then I end up with issues with the model fitting because either I added a bug or an erroneous assumption or just too much complexity for the sampler to handle. Another thing is um, prior predictive checks, something like in the last year or two, uh, I started making regular part of my workflow super, super helpful for making sure that uh, your all your priors are actually going to give you, are actually going to allow the sampler to explore a reasonable range that would fit your data. And I think that will also help a little bit with uh, divergences and convergence. And then um, 
Yeah, I had a third thing that I was going to say, but I don't actually think it's relevant. So I, those would be my, my two little tips there. Cool. That makes sense. Uh, another question just came in as well. So people are getting excited about the content. I, I like your example on defaults and I, I appreciate the high level insights, but how could you use it to understand if any individual loan may default? Uh, that is a great question. So again, this is, um, that could be like another critique of this model, right? Is that, um, you know, you couldn't necessarily use something like this for underwriting um, because it's, it's uh, you know, as defined on these slides, it's basically just going to give you back the averages from your data. Now you can make it a little bit more intelligent by, you know, adding groups and maybe hierarchies and things like that. Um, so you could generalize to subsets of your data, but still not something that you can necessarily use for underwriting, but great tool. As I mentioned earlier, at least in, in my opinion, great tool I find for just more the data exploration and analysis. Cool. Uh, one more. The, does the process to be modeled have to be episodic? By that I mean the start in the same initial condition and then ends after finite time t. Or can you still fit a model to an indefinitely long dynamic process? Uh, I, I might need more context to answer that question, but I think the answer may just be that like, I mean, again, if I think if your assumptions about the data generating process are reasonable and they're strong, um, and you have enough data, you should be able to extrapolate pretty far out, but I, I would probably need more context to like actual, actually give an answer. Cool. Uh, so we, uh, Bill says, thanks. Um, uh, another anonymous attendee asked, you don't have to answer, but leveraging innovation approach, do the Eagles win the Super Bowl? As a Chilean, that doesn't mean anything to me. Uh, the, yeah, yeah. Um, my highlights of 2023, Eagles winning the Super Bowl and Phillies winning the World Series. So. Cool. That, uh, th th that was just gibberish to me. But I, I did have a question from my side. Um, what would you what would you recommend people starting a first principle approach? A lot of times I see, for example, even in the gold pattern example or other examples, when you show it at the end, it is it looks perfectly reasonable and it's like, oh, these people are geniuses because they came up with this amazing approach. Sometimes, like you were saying before, people actually start like step by step, and then you face like many paths that were incorrect, but uh, you usually show the end solution that makes sense. Uh, did was that your experience? And can what could you tell someone starting in this process about that? Yeah, that's. I mean, it's totally correct. I think I had a line in the collab notebook that was something like, you know, um, around the putting example, like the solution to all interesting problems. Uh, it's obvious, but only once you know it. <laughs> so. In my experience, this is one of those things you just have to try it a lot um, and keep working at it. And you develop a little bit better intuition over time, but um, you know, it, it's always an iterative process. Um, so I, I will say though, another thing about this is um, I mean, this is a this is a great um, this is a great method to collaborate with other people on. So, you know, your your coworkers, your colleagues, whatever. This is the kind of thing you can brainstorm on a whiteboard. And uh, I mean, even just thinking about here at Perpay, the other data scientists that I work with, we've had quite a few whiteboarding sessions where it's like, well, in theory, it should work like this. And then you write the code and it actually does work like that. Not always, but it, you know, it's uh, a collaboration I think can really help here because uh, it, just multiple perspectives gives you a good idea, a better idea of, you know, um, what assumptions are, you know, good and which ones maybe not so much. Cool. Yeah, thank you for answering my question. I think that's the advantage of being a host. The, so I think with that, it's a wrap. Uh, first of all, like thank you so much, Dante. That, that was an amazing presentation. It, it was great collaborating to you with you. To all the people that attended, thank you. The PyMCCon just started. This is the first event. There are many more to come. We just updated the list of events, and the next one 
is in 11 days. So very soon, you don't have to wait long. And it's an introduction to multi-output Gaussian processes. And um, there's a lot more to come. Some pretty interesting talks, some for beginners, some for intermediates, some for uh, for advanced. Reshama posted the link in the chat. So feel free to, to follow that and ask us any questions. And also the CFP is open, so the call hold proposals. So you can still submit it. If you have an idea for a talk, you can still submit your idea and we will review it. It's a double blind process. So we will know your name or anything uh, to when we review it. So that I think that we're proud about how the process works and it's very well explained in the PineCon website. You can also look at the organizers there. There's a lot of people behind this uh, all donating their free time just by the lab of patient statistics. Some people would call them crazy. I, I call them PineCers. <laughs> so it, it was great uh, having you all here. Thank you, Dante. Thank you. Bye.